All right, I wanted to welcome everybody to today's webinar on the grid of the future around the recently released Grid Modernization Index that we built in collaboration and with the amazing work of the GridWise Alliance. I'm Bryce Yonker, Clean Edge Director of Business Development, and we have more than 250 participants registered for today's webinar, and we wanted to welcome all of you. Just a couple quick housekeeping notes. Everybody today is in a listen-only mode, uh, but we do want to capture as many questions from the participants and from you in the audience as possible. So we'd welcome you to type in your questions throughout the session. Simply type your questions into the chat box, go to the webinar uh, toggle field, and we will address as many of these as we possibly can during the session. Um, just take note that we're recording today's webinar and we will post it um, on our YouTube channel um, shortly after today's session. So thanks again for joining and hope that you um, have an excellent discussion with us. And I'm going to hand it over now to Clean Edge's Managing Director, Ron Pernick. Over to you, Ron. Thank you, Bryce. Um, I, I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar. It's been an absolute privilege to be working with the GridWise Alliance on the release of their third annual Grid Modernization Index. Um, I'd really like to recognize our partner the GridWise Alliance, for those of you who don't know them, for their hard work and the critical effort they put into the GMI. The GridWise Alliance is a coalition of electricity industry stakeholders that brings together electric utilities, industry suppliers, and service providers from the equipment, communications, and information technology sectors. Joined by universities, national labs, and others, the GWA works to enhance electric grid performance and transform our nation's electric system to meet the needs of the 21st century. Obviously critical work. With us today to help us unpack and better understand the latest grid modernization developments and trends are Steve Hauser, CEO of GridWise Alliance, Ann McCabe, Commissioner of the Illinois Commerce Commission, and Kenny or Kenneth Mercado, Senior VP, Electric Operations, Centerpoint Energy and Taxes. Uh, just so you know, we've got a wide uh, range of geographies today with our panelists and myself dialing in either from Chicago, Charlotte, Denver, uh, or Portland, Oregon, where I am. So uh, it, it's really great to have this. And as you guys all know who've been on our webinars before, um, we really like to encourage a lively and interactive conversation. So first, Steve and I are going to present some of the key findings from this year's GMI. The, the GMI is available both on the Clean Edge website and the GridWise website. Uh, next, we'll set the stage with an initial question to each of the panelists, and then we're going to launch into moderated Q&A. For the last 15 minutes or so, we'll take questions from the audience. So as Bryce mentioned earlier, uh, please start getting your questions into the, the chat box, uh, and, 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 and Bryce will get those over to me. So, so let's now just look a little bit at why the GMI? Um, and, and I think if we could start with where we are today, what does the grid look like? And while this isn't true across the board, many of today's utilities still operate with a model based on a one-way flow of electrons and the centralized generation and management of those electrons. Uh, in many ways, this grid looks remarkably similar to what Edison invented more than a century ago. So that's what we've got up here. Um, and, and thank you, Apri, for, for the, the, these, these diagrams. Um, um, so, but things are, as you can see in this, are changing. Um, and, and while this is an exact replica of what's happening today, it, it, it gives an idea of what's going on. And in some quick cases, those changes are happening quite dramatically. The, the new emerging model represents diverse generation, advanced controls, and the two-way flows of electricity. Uh, as Steve and Becky wrote in the foreword of this year's GMI, Electricity continues to be at the heart of our economy and truly does power our lives. As our economy becomes even more digitally driven, electricity becomes all the more critical. As a result, how we manage and operate our electric grid must also evolve to a more digital automated system. So that's what the GMI works to track. And as you can see here, uh, it's focused on documenting that transition by looking at three major areas. Um, and, and what I want to first say is that the first GMI was released in 2013, the second in 2014. This is its third iteration uh, ranking states on these broad categories. So the first one, not in any particular order, state support, which is based on plans and policies that support grid modernization, customer engagement, which ranks states on their rate structures, customer outreach, and data collection practices to engage customers, 
and grid operations, which benchmarks the deployment of grid modernization technologies such as sensors and smart meters, as well as the advanced capabilities they enable. Each state, as you can see, can earn a total of 100 points, split 30, 34, and 36, respectively, among the categories shown here. Here are the full results of this year's GMI. Um, you can get an idea here of the top 10, and, and it's pretty easy to sort of look at the right-hand side to see the score, and also the rank changes year over year. These are, again, available in the report. California is the highest ranked state in this year's GMI with a score of 87.8, which is more than six points higher than its score in 2014. The state ranks first in customer engagement as it did in the previous GMI, and second in both state support and grid operations. California has a six and a half point lead over second place Illinois, while Texas ranks third. So we have folks from Illinois and Texas on the, on the line today, so we're very excited about that. Maryland and Delaware, two of four states in the top 10 that lie fully within the PGM interconnection territory, each move up a spot to fourth and fifth respectively. This year, the top states have started to pull away from the rest of the field. In the previous GMI, the difference between first and fifth was 15.3 points, now it is almost 28 points. So we're seeing some significant changes. Um, and let me just talk a little bit about the bottom half of the top 10, also going through some significant shifts. Uh, the District of Columbia increases its ranking by two places to six. It's followed by Oregon, which adds 11 points to its overall school, school, uh, score, excuse me, with big improvements in customer engagement and grid operations. Arizona and Pennsylvania are tied for eighth the latter fell 19.3 points, though its ranking only fell four places. Finally, Georgia ranks 10th. Um, so what I'd like to do now is hand the deck over to Steve. He's going to walk us through some of the key findings and what's driving activity, and then we'll go into Q&A. So Steve, over to you. Thanks, Ron. And, and I want to give my thanks to Clean Edge for their leadership in this, and in particular, setting up this webinar. We certainly hope it's going to be useful to those that are participating today. We just have a couple slides here to, to drill just a little bit deeper and then hopefully many of you have reviewed the GMI report already and may have some questions that, that take us even deeper into some of the details of the report. If, if we look at major developments, obviously there's developments going on in a number of states, right? We can probably we can probably expand this list to uh, 20 or 25 states pretty easily and, and highlight things going on in each of those states. We picked we pick these just to be a little bit noteworthy. Um, one of the things that's probably important to note is, while we mentioned California and the work that's going on there, the other four states that we mentioned are not even in the top 10. They're, really, they're in the second 10, right? So they, they kind of vary from 12th to 20th. Uh, place in our ranking, but <clears throat> these are policy activities, and one of the things we note in the report is that policy activities tend to drive grid modernization, right? It, it's not certainly not the only factor, but things that are happening, for instance, in New York, the REV process, which is very much being driven by the governor's staff and the, and the commission there, um, you know, is, is beginning to drive changes in New York. Massachusetts is starting to really expect more out of their utilities with regard to grid modernization. And Minnesota and Hawaii both have things going on there that are they're clearly driving this. What we would expect is that um, you know, the next, the fourth GMI, which we expect to come out uh, sometime in the next 12 to 15 months, is likely to have um, is likely to see these states move up uh, significantly because of the policy activities that are going on there. Uh, Ron, next next slide. There we go. I mean, one as, as everybody on the call I'm sure knows, one of the big drivers is the, the deployment of AMI. The Recovery Act certainly uh, bumped a lot of the states up uh, with regard to their AMI penetration. Uh, what, what's probably important to note is that, you know, the, the states that tend to have more uh, AMI uh, penetration are also those states which are tending to modernize their grid overall. You know, AMI, well, it's clearly focused on engaging consumers, 
uh, it also provides data out of the edge of the grid that's important for utilities to use as they look for opportunities to really optimize the, their, their grid, uh, both in terms of peak management, in terms of outage management, and things like that. I'm sure we'll hear that more from Kenny and Ann going forward. Uh, yeah, go ahead and take the next slide. So we'll hit a few key takeaways. Um, you know, again, we could we could probably have a list of 20 or 30. Uh, these are probably not the only uh, insights that we have in, in the GMI report. But again, as anyone that's been involved in uh, grid modernization projects across utilities and in states, the the the, the issue of in finding ways to provide the funding and the investments. Uh, is always a challenge, right? And every utility, every state has a little bit different approach based on their unique situations, but that this continues to be a, a challenge and it's something that, that is uh, uh, discussed a lot amongst regulators and utilities. Um, second, you know, as Ron mentioned already, the leading states are tending to, to pull away a little bit. I, there's there's nothing magic there. I think it's more that the the top 10 or 20 states are are not slowing down. I think that's one of the observations is those those that are that are paying as much attention to this as anybody uh, continue to to uh, increase their efforts in this space and and so that they tend to pull away from the states that are aren't really doing a whole lot. Um, as I mentioned already, there's a high correlation with AMI penetration. There's also a high correlation with market deregulation. We're not arguing that that's a direct driver. We're just observing that there tends to be a correlation uh, between the states that are uh, active in grid modernization and those that aren't. And there tends to be a, a presence of the demand response programs, I think indicating as much as anything that states are paying attention to to the value consumers can provide in, in the modernization efforts. <clears throat> um, there's, there's clearly more benefits to be realized. I think, uh, again, we may hear some anecdotes from, from Kenny and, and Ann on this, but you know, I, I continue to hear from a, a variety of utilities that you know, they, they did their business case, they made their investments, and what they discovered was there was even more benefits and more value created from those investments than they expected. So that's a that's a positive thing. Um, dynamic rate structure reforms, uh, you know, tend to tend to help unlock some of the benefits out at the edge of the grid, the the customer involvement, um, and those are going to be important. And then, you know, lastly, there's there's clearly not a one size fits all uh, approach to this. So. From, from Gridwise's viewpoint, we want to make it clear that we're not trying to uh, create a template that we expect everyone to follow. We understand that utilities, cities, uh, you know, counties, states all have different constraints, all have different things they have to consider when they're looking at their investments. And so it's important for us to look at a wide variety of solutions that are really unique to those situations. Great. So, Steve, what, what I'd like to do now is we're, we're going to go in an interactive portion, and, and I think that hopefully we give people a decent overview. Obviously, the, the report is many pages long and has a lot of tables and charts, so we encourage people to look at it who haven't seen it yet. Um, you know, and, and, and in tracking what was going on, we, we looked sort of what's currently happening, what, what, what have people implemented. So, with that in mind, um, when you look out three to five years, which emerging trends do you see having the greatest impact uh, on enabling this progress in grid modernization? I think if we could just look at the short to midterm, yeah. what are the big things that are happening? Well, so that's a great question, Ron. As, as I just was saying, you know, it's obvious probably to everyone on the phone that every state utility is a little bit different. And so trying to generalize trends is, is difficult, right? Because situations are unique but what I would what I would observe is that for many of the, of the states many of the utilities an increase in um, clean technology in particular distributed technologies rooftop solar wind electric vehicles, battery storage 
and there's other distributed resources as well. Um, that, that will continue to dominate as a trend uh, for many utilities. Uh, for other utilities, the drivers may be more focused on how to manage the impact of major outages, right? Major storms. Um, you know, uh, Center Point in Houston is a, certainly uh, a utility that has to deal with that. And so, you know, in, in dealing with those outages, and you know, the utilities tend to look at automated equipment. You know, better forecasting, being able to place resources um, in in places where they know outages will occur to restore power faster. You know, there's even look in many states at, at microgrids and, and uh, other technologies that may help customers ride through storms. The last area, I guess, is, um, you know, focus more on managing against the peak. Um, so that's clearly one of the things driving the rev activity in New York. Um, I think, again, it's, it's, it's an important issue for both Illinois and Texas. So. Maybe Kenny and Ann will talk a little bit more about that. But it's being able to use distributed resources and particular customer loads to be able to respond better to peak uh, situations and, and be able to use the system a little more effectively. Um, you know, it's often referred to asset management. Um, and uh, so I think that'll be a trend too. Great. So, so just to recap for everyone, if I got it right, the, the, some of the main drivers in the mid short to midterm will be clean energy, renewables integration, resiliency efforts, and then peak management demand response. Yes. So I, just for everybody, I, I mean, that all makes sense and, and really important. So let's talk more about that. What I want to do now is go to you, Commissioner McCabe. Um, the, the role of state commissions across the country has become more complex in recent years with increasing change in the electricity generation, transmission, and distribution markets. I personally have been just really excited to see some of the innovation uh, among commissioners like yourself and in New York uh, with Zeibelman and others. So against this backdrop, how do you see the role of the regulator with relation to various grid modernization efforts evolving as we move forward? So sort of what's the role of the regulator and, and what do you see unfolding? Thank you. The role of the regulator is the same in some ways and in changing in others. The basic mission of PUCs and regulators remains the same, least cost, reliable electricity, just and reasonable rates, and balancing the interests of utilities, their shareholders and customers. On the other hand, as Steve has alluded to, technology is changing quickly as our customer expectations. Distributed generation is increasing. In Illinois, legislation in 2011 called for a 3.2 billion investment in both grid hardening and smart meter implementation by our two main electric, electric utilities by 2019. By the end of this year, ComEd expects to have about 2.8 million smart meters installed out of a total of 4 million. And Ameren will have installed about 387,000 out of 780,000. Both utilities have peak time rebate or savings programs. Uh, smart meter saturation will enable a host of smart devices, smart homes, and dynamic pricing options, which can help reduce customer bills and ship load at peak or critical times. ComEd has found that greater customer satisfaction and increased effectiveness when they pair their peak time rebate program with direct load control. They ran a pilot and controlled smart thermostats. This increased, increased load reduction significantly for their peak time rebate customers. So by approving pilots, whether for smart meters, uh, direct load control, smart devices, or microgrids, regulators can help maximize the value of grid modernization benefits. Regulators can help unlock innovation by third-party software and hardware so customers can better manage their consumption and spending. Great. Well, we're going to get to talk more about that as we uh, get through the questions today and, and hopefully get lots of questions from the audience. Um, Kenny, um, utilities across the country are grappling with how to effectively and economically uh, deploy grid modernization efforts within their ter territories. As Commissioner McCabe said, you know, cost is, is, is key here. Can you tell us a bit about how you have implemented recent grid modernization initiatives at, at your utility at, at, via CenterPoint? Yeah, happy to do so, and great to be here. It's a privilege to have an opportunity to speak. Uh, at CenterPoint Energy, we're committed to bringing 
really being a leader in building this intelligent energy future that you described earlier. Uh, with our initiatives, we've been working on this grid modernization effort really for probably about 10 years. We expect measurable benefits and, and a, truly a greater emphasis on the distribution system as we move forward. Uh, what we're really experiencing is the conversion of operational cons consumer and informational technology systems. Uh, let me give you a few examples of that. Uh, we started with putting our advanced metering system in place in 2009, went live in 2009. We've deployed over 2.3 million advanced meters and completed that project in middle of 2012 and continue to see uh, exceptional uh, benefits from the advanced metering system even through this date. Uh, we, we installed our customer vision platform uh, in 2012 and continue to build off of that platform. And, and the purpose there is really to create a better engagement, a bridge, a stronger bridge between the, the operation of our grid and the consumer and what the consumer wants over the long term. We have uh, deployed intelligent grid switching devices to provide a, more of a self-healing uh, hardening aspect of the grid. Uh, which has resulted in about a 25% improvement in safety, just in about 15% of our service territory, and continue to see great benefits from a reliability perspective. We went live with our advanced distribution management system in April of 2015, so we have about a year of uh, real-time experience with our advanced management system on the distribution side of our grid. We also went live with what we call our power alert service uh, feature, in January of 2015, we have almost two years, a year and a half of experience, which basically enables us to recognize when the power's out by the meter sending us a signal, communicating that to customer before they even know their power is out in most cases, keep them uh, aware of the event and allow them to do other things while we restore power to take care of, of the operations. That's gone really well for about a half a million customers thus far. We continue to focus on uh, utilizing real-time situational awareness type techniques coming from the, the, uh, the, the advancements, advancements in data analytics. Uh, we also went live uh, last year with an advanced mobile work, uh, workforce platform that really gets our data out to our field crews so we can be much more intelligent in the field as we are in our back office. And finally, we continue to work hard to build an asset management platform uh, from an enterprise perspective that gives us a much more visibility on the health and wellness of our assets across the transmission substation and distribution environment. So I'm, I'm going to hold there and uh, we'll go deeper into questions of later. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and Kenny, I really appreciate that because that's a, 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 quite a depth and breadth of activity. So I'm looking forward to talking about how the utility is able to, to do all that uh, and, and you sort of manage the processes. Um, so, so one of the things that we found in the GMI, and, and it, you know, it's hard to do these correlations, but uh, we showed that both penetration of EVs and, and DG, distributed generation, DERs or distributed renewables, were, were connected in some ways to the GMI scores. So we started to talk about this a little bit, but, but how do you guys see the developments of DERs impacting overall grid modernization efforts? And, I think maybe Kenny, if we get to start with you, since you're you're dealing with that, on, uh, you know, in, in various ways. So why don't we start with you and then go to Ann and Steve? Kenny, are you still there? Sorry about that. Yes, uh, I had my button on mute. That happens um, all the time. No problem. <laughs> I think what we're seeing today really is still the the early phase of the integration of, of distributed energy resources, and I think you could say that pretty pretty much across the United States. Um, over the next few years, probably the next three to five years, you will begin to see more and more investment, some of which is from the utility side of, of the spectrum. Some of it will be on the maybe the larger CNI side of, of the business, but you will see more integration of distributed energy resources in the coming few years. Uh, and, and so we have to be ready. Our grids have to be prepared to uh, not only to be able to integrate, but also to have visibility and be able to uh, look at their modeling and be able to plan and, and, and really understand how those distributed energy resources will be utilized. So there's, there's a, still a lot of questions, uh, and we're all working together to make sure we have good answers to the questions that remain out there. Commissioner McCabe in Illinois, what are you guys witnessing? I agree. It's still we're still in the early stages of Illinois. Also, um, ER growth presents 
new challenges, but we're better equipped to handle it with grid modernization implementation. Plus, it's a driver for looking at how should the current electricity market structure be transformed or changed in the future. And to the extent that DERs contribute to generation, uh, communication will be central, will help keep the system balanced, and better communication will also help DERs contribute to microgrids, which uh, is a significant interest of some of our utilities here. Steve, thank you for that. Steve, I think you know you sort of have a vantage point of looking at places uh, more broadly. You know, a lot of a lot of stakeholders that we're tracking in the GMI. What, what's your sense? Because obviously there's been some things, but what? Do, how do you view DERs and and their impact? I know yeah. you mentioned it earlier, but please. Well, I mean, clearly the economics of distributed resources are getting you know better and better, and and that's going to tend to drive things. Um, uh, you know, increase the market share of distributed resources and clearly get customers to pay more attention as, as the economics get even better. I think the aha for me in the last year or so is how many commercial customers are really, you know, paying attention to this. So whether it's a Walmart or Target or, or uh, somebody like Amazon.com with their data centers and their distribution centers, you know, they're starting to demand a much higher level of renewables. Um, and I think in some cases, the utilities are working closely with them to find ways to, to uh, you know, optimize to be able to provide those resources in, in the utility environment and integrate them into the utility environment. So I, th I think it's, it's a combination of residential and commercial, but I, but I think commercial is going to tend to drive this um, even more strongly in the next few years. Great, and as you know, we, we had that report that came out through Clean Edge a, a few months back about both governments and corporates that are, you know, targeting 100%, some are already there. So obviously having an impact. Um, you know, I didn't know if we would get into this, but do you have a sense, and maybe Steve, I'll put this to you first, uh, if you look at Nevada and what sort of played out there, um, with regulators sort of siding with NV Energy, and it's interesting. It's not like renewables are being squashed there. It just said it's going to be, you know, they're 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 sort of uh, favoring utility scale versus distributed. Steve, do you have any comments or thoughts about what what those type of developments might mean to all of this? Well, it's hard to predict. I mean, again, we get we get in, and I'd be curious as the commissioners view of this, but each state kind of has a different view on this, and I think it's going to go, you know, sort of back and forth while it plays out. Um, my sense is what's really driving this is not the technology providers, but it's the, it's a consumer pull, and Ron, you may have more insight into that, but I, but I think as, as the consumer pull tends to increase, uh, you know, regulators will have to pay attention to that for sure. Commissioner McCabe, do, do you want to comment at all on? I, I want to be careful here. Obviously, it's another state, but do you have any thoughts about what played out in Nevada? Uh, no, I. But I would say that Illinois can learn from the five or so states that are much further ahead on um, solar integration than we are. So. Got it. Yeah, I, I would say, Steve. You know, we've done a lot of consumer polling for the last few years, and overwhelmingly, uh, both. Uh, individual residential customers as well as commercial industrial customers uh, want choice and and increasingly they have mandates or 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 man you know campaigns to get to a to a pretty significant uh, renewable deployment and, and in our view distributed is a key part of that so um, I think one of the things I want to talk about today is is bringing stakeholders together um, obviously to, to I mean just listening to you Kenny <laughs> That's a lot of stuff you're doing, and it's not easy, and you need to get a lot of stakeholders on the same page. So uh, I want to get maybe first from you, Ann, and, and then from you, Kenny, but in your experiences, how did the various stakeholders get on the same page, and what are you doing to enable that? Because we have a lot of people on the phone today who are probably grappling with those kind of issues. So Ann, could we start with you? Sure. Uh, a couple thoughts. Uh, a number of steps led up to the 2011 mm -hmm. Energy Infrastructure Modernization Act. There was a smart grid collaborative stakeholder process from about 2008 to 2010. There was a smart grid pilot and an AMA rider. 
I would not say all the stakeholders were on the same page. There were a lot of discussions, uh, and the discussions and pilots were helpful and led to the passage of legislation. Um, we're now five years into AMI through our formula rate legislation and the utilities NGOs are discussing what's next on the continuum. Uh, three bills have been introduced that address clean energy, uh, including bills to increase the energy efficiency and renewable portfolio standards, possibly create a demand charge, microgrid pilots, community solar, and a low carbon or clean energy standard that would help at-risk nuclear plants. Illinois has six nuclear plants and it's the largest nuclear generator in the country. We also have a stakeholder advisory group on energy efficiency and a smart grid advisory council that meet regularly to discuss a variety of energy efficiency and smart grid issues. So I think there's, there's a number of forums, including policy forums that the commission has, which get the stakeholders together and help them determine where there's areas of consensus and that can help in the documented cases as well as uh, other efforts. Great, um, Kenny, how about you? Yeah, I will just add that, you know, it, it really has to be economic. It has to be economical if it's going to meet the needs of the large majority of stakeholders. So I, I would emphasize that the, the economy is, the economic piece of this is really important, and that means limited subsidies. It needs to be standalone and, and economic on its own merits. Uh, it, it also, it, 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 when we look at modernization efforts, there's so many things that you want to do, but you got to be, you got to be reasonable. You can't you can't pick and choose. You got to have a very strategic pr approach. You have to have a more of a, a visionary uh, idea of what you want to build over a 10 or 15 year period of time. And when you, when you're looking at the initiatives, they they need to be scalable. They cannot just serve a need in one little area. They have to be scalable and commercial across the uh, the, the U.S. And so we really look hard towards. Um, vendors and suppliers who can serve the market that can provide a, a real long-term sustainable solution uh, and can support whatever initiatives that we're putting in place. So, and, and then I would just say that in, in Texas, where it's a deregulated state, it, there, there are many stakeholders, and so it, the initiative has to meet the needs of the competitive market, which ultimately gets down to, as has been said earlier, um, that it gets down to the customer. So the customer wants choice. The customer wants affordable, they want options. Um, if the customer gets what their needs are, or if their needs are met, then the market wins. And if the market wins, then everybody has a stake and everybody has an opportunity to get uh, benefit from it. So that's, that's kind of where I will leave it at this point based on your question. Great. Um, Steve, do you have anything to add to that before we move on to the next question? Yeah, just a little. I mean, the Gridwise Alliance has been around 12 years now, you know, principally working on educating stakeholders. You know, I, I was actually up on Capitol Hill last week and met with staff both on the Senate side and the House side. And, you know, there's a high level of interest, but the interest is pretty conceptual, right? It's like grid modernization is a good thing. We should be doing more. But the questions I got from, from the folks on the Hill last week were really, we need specifics, right? We need to understand more details about what the impacts are, you know, what the benefits are, why consumers should care about this. And so we still have a lot of work to do on, on educating, you know, stakeholders in terms of the details. Great. I, I, I want to re remind everyone to please uh, type your questions into the chat box, and, and Bryce is already starting to send those over to me, which is great because it aligns with some of the questions I had prepared. So I'm going to start uh, integrating some of the questions from the audience, but, but let me ask you guys this question. Really want to look at tariff structures, um, you know, things like time of use pricing, perhaps being core to enabling grid modernization. I like, like your take on that. Um, th there's a question from the audience that sort of plays on that. And, and basically, um, I think one of their concerns is how do you have time of use pricing and greater variation in, in rates for customers? Um, in the face of a, a historically one-size-fits-all non-discriminatory rate policy that regulators have, have hoed to. So, um, and why don't we start with you? What's your take on the critical nature or not of time of use pricing and other rate structures? And then how does that sort of match up with historical uh, balances and checks that regulators have uh, applied? I think both 
tariff structure and time of use pricing are important. And one of the challenges of AMI is how to get customer or household adoption of time of use pricing, uh, peak shaving, et cetera. I think we're still in the early stages of, of figuring that out. And we also see some jurisdictions in states like California who are thinking about or doing opt-out time of use pricing. It'll be interesting to see how that works. Uh, Steve and Kenny, uh, any thoughts about time of use pricing and other rate tariff structures? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that in, in our in our market down in, in, in the Texas area, the, the there is no real tariff-based pricing. It's 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 uh, it's it's basically a plan. You either, either you select a a short-term plan on a three six-month scale or a longer-term plan on a year two or three-year scale, and and most customers are have really kind of built savviness within their own mind of who they select from a retail perspective. And there are many customers, hundreds of thousands, I don't have the exact number, who choose to, to select a free nights or free weekend program. And they, they do that because uh, they're, they maybe they have a different profile how they use electricity and maybe it's more important to them to have uh, free power and evens and, and weekends. I, I don't know why, but uh, but there is, there is a, a, a move towards a, a, a more tailored um, uh, load arrangement between the retailer and the, and the consumer. And it seems to be working pretty well, and that does add value, and it helps us in terms of looking at peak demand and trying to focus on those th th that critical aspect of, of gr grid modeling and, and uh, design. Steve, what's your, what's your take on this topic? Well, part of it's just a consumer education issue, Ron, that, you know, we, we for a hundred years have had this compact with consumers that uh, that basically tells them that they can use as much electricity as they want any time of the day, any time of the year, and any anywhere, right? And we just can't do that anymore. And so it's helping to educate consumers that you know on a hot summer day, um, you know, in certain markets it's very expensive to provide that electricity, and they they need to be sensitive to, of that, and they need to participate in helping us to you know, reduce the overall cost of operating the system by, you know, participating in those um, in those times when energy costs a lot more. You know, exactly how that translates into tariffs and rate structures is complicated at best, right? But hopefully we can find ways to make it easier for consumers to understand that if they reduce their energy costs, or energy use on you know certain days or certain times of the year that it benefits every everybody not just them. <clears throat> you know this concept of the consumer has come up many times in our call already today, and obviously that can be the CNI customer or 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 residential. Can anyone on the line think of some good examples of some ways that utilities are engaging with customers in in a in a new and, and interesting way. I Steve, do, do you have anything that you could point to that sort of illustrates some of the breakthroughs that we might be seeing? Well, I guess I, I mean I can start. There's there's certainly apps that are popping up um, uh, where people can get a better sense as to what's going on in the grid and their own energy use by just looking at their iPhones. Um, you know, I, I myself watch, you know, Home Depot and Lowe's and notice over the last year, 18 months, a lot more products popping up that, you know, that are um, our home energy management pro products, whether it's smart thermostats or or other products that, that you can use to help manage your energy better. So I, I think we're starting to see it's it's very much the tip of the iceberg, but I think we're starting to see some progress in that. Ron, Ron the, what, one thing I would mention is, you know, when we when you introduced the, the topic today, you talked about the utility that had the sort of the one way approach right. in the past, and, and that's the Tom the Edison approach, and we all we're all there. Uh, you know that that's a real reactive way to, to to operate. We know that, and so basically mm -hmm. that means when something goes wrong, then the customer calls and they have an issue and they want to get it addressed. Uh, and, and I think what's different today is is we're trying to be more predictive. We're trying to be more proactive. And if you just looked at our power alert service that I think many utilities across the U.S. are starting to implement, what that does is it tells you the power is out, and and it's going to tell you as a consumer when the power will come back on, at least an estimate. 
And, uh, and, and if, you, if you do a good job of, of meeting that estimate, then the customer gives you appreciation. We've seen uh, example after example after example where we get testimony. We, you know, it's very rare to get testimony. We get nice comments, nice feedback from our, from our customer, customers. shouldn't say testimony, but just feed, good positive feedback that says, thank you for letting me know that you know that my power is out and that you have a solution to my, to my issue. And, and you know, I'd like to know what went wrong. And so we're trying to get better at predicting. We're trying to get better at uh, you know, expressing what, what occurred in, in real time and, and promoting more proactive engagements uh, that customers get benefit from. Yeah, Kenny, it's interesting. Someone actually asked that question that came through just now, and, and they wanted to understand specifically how you do that communication process. So are you giving text alerts? Are they getting, how, how, are they getting emails, phone calls? How do you let people know uh, the update on the, the progress of when the power is going to come back up? Yeah, it, and it's only, we, so we market this as a, as a program to customers. Uh, we emphasize it more during storms. Uh, when we have a customer call in and, and tell us their power's out, we let them know that we can give them this feature. So they, they choose to, to opt in, and then uh, we, you know, we'd like to have as, as much uh, data as we can in terms of their choice of how they want to be communicated with. We have the ability to, to have uh, five different uh, types of – we actually have the ability to have uh, ten different communication channels uh, to the consumer's choice uh, so that when they're ready to uh, – hear something, we can give it to them in, in, their, in whatever mode they want. Typically, email works well, but a lot of folks like text or, or other means of communication, and they want to still use a hardline phone, we can do that as well. So we're just trying to be uh, more in the middle of being able to provide the service that the customer wants proactively than just doing it one way like, like we have in the past. Now, that requires a communication platform. That requires a, an enterprise system. You got to build that system, to be able to have that level of uh, of engagement. Great. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about funding off the grid modernization efforts because this isn't necessarily inexpensive to do. Uh, the Recovery Act gave you know billions of dollars to to do these rollouts across the country. How are we funding all of this today? Um, and maybe we could start with Anne, your experiences in Illinois, and just as you know more broadly across the country. But what are some ways to, to finance the, the build out as the Recovery Act dollars sort of dissipate? Right. And Illinois, uh, AMI, AMI was not funded through ERA. So as I said, we had legislation that passed in 2011 that established a formula rate process. We're now five years in. This gives the utilities much more certainty. There's an annual process, rate of return and other variables are set. There's an annual reconciliation of estimated and actual expenses with interest on reconciliation. Uh, so unlike traditional cases where the utility would uh, spend the money and then have to get cost recovery, this, this takes a lot of the uh, variables off the table. And after five years of formula rate, we're seeing pure contested issues, reduced external legal and expert expenses, and last year the uh, hearing was half a day. That's that's probably not the norm with other states. I also note that Illinois is doing, you know, AMI now, while Massachusetts and New York are just starting those efforts and have kind of put more of the utility of the future on the front burner. Yeah. So lots of questions coming in. I want to thank everyone for those. Keep them coming in. And just to follow up on that, someone asked that sort of. Do you see other states adopting more of this incentive-based regulation model that has enabled your uh, utilities to, to sort of forward their grid modernization efforts? Is, is that something you would imagine you'll see in other states? I, I think states, there's, there's a number of states looking at how to do things differently in the future. There's also the Rio model in the UK. I will say under our current legislation, there are a lot of metrics. There's penalties for not meeting the metrics there's no reward for exceeding the metrics. And I think that'll definitely be a discussion for us going forward. And symmetrical incentives are something a lot of people are talking about. Great, Steve, what's your take on financing uh, the grid modernization efforts? Obviously with our dollars gone, and, and it's great to hear Illinois and sort of how they've done it without those dollars, but sort of your take on, you know, this takes money, so how do you fund it? Yeah, you know, Again, it's it's not a one size fits all solution, right? So every every situation is a little bit different. 
every utility is a little bit different, and, and I hear lots of variety in terms of how the funding is taking place. Most, most utilities, you know, recognize that there's a benefit that outweighs the cost, right? So it doesn't mean there isn't a rate increase associated with it, but a lot of people think if we, if we don't invest in modernizing the grid that rates will stay the same or go down, and that's just not usually the case. So in many cases, this is a better solution than, you know, not doing anything. Um, but again, it, it varies a lot from, from place to place. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of lessons learned being shared now, and and I'd be curious if Ann has any observation on that. But in the last year or two, I see a lot more, more discussion going on at Beirut amongst regulators, you know, trying to understand, you know, what the impacts are, what the value is. Um, and understanding, you know, how to how to do it in a way that's most cost effective to the, you know, to the to the uh, consumers. And did you want to comment on that, or should I move on to Kenny? Uh, quickly, uh, like I said, there are, there are a number of states kind of looking at what their electric market should look like in the future. Niruk has also created a staff subcommittee on rate design so that staff from the various states can talk about uh, what they're thinking about, what they're doing, how's it going, share best practices, and have a, a, a more uh, information sharing and experience sharing. So, so expanding resources for people to share information. Can, 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 you, can, can you tell us a little bit on your end, sort of this idea of financing, what are your experiences in Texas in a deregulated market? Yeah, and, and, and Commissioner McCabe answered very well. I, I think in, in our state, Texas, we, we were fortunate. Our, our, our leadership came from our public utility commissioners, and they, they recognized the benefits um, early because of the competitive market was going to provide more of this functionality all the way to the consumer. So they saw the, the longer-term uh, value of, of the investment. And so what we were able to do is build a business case and get it approved uh, get a recovery uh, system in place and, and make, it, make it functional, make it uh, meaningful as quickly as possible. And then on top of that, uh, we, we were able to meet the needs of our commission. We were also able to meet the needs of our market. And then the Department of Energy created their smart grid investment grants. Uh, and we were able to uh, win a, a grant by demonstrating shovel, red, shovel readiness. And the, re the result of the, the, of the SGIG allowed us to accelerate our investment. And so our, our metering investment today is already, is already in uh, past tense in terms of payment. We've already uh, made the investment and recovered the, the cost, and we're moving beyond that now. So we have a lot to be thankful for, and it really stems from our commission and from the support of the Department of Energy. It was a great collaboration. So, so I want to propose something to the panel here or just get your feedback. Um, Obviously, it's very clear that we're still in a nascent phase. And, and when I, you know, we track clean energy broadly, but within the renewable sector, there's sort of this debate that goes back and forth, and it plays out a bit with Bill Gates. Uh, you know, basically, do we have the technologies we already need? There's a whole bunch of people like Jigger Shaw and Joe Rome and others like, hey, we have the technologies. It's a deployment issue now. It's it's a market issue. And then Bill Gates will say something like, no, we need these energy miracles. I, I'm wondering from the perspective of this panel, because this is still so nascent, do we have most of the technologies we need today for modernizing our grid, or um, are, are those breakthroughs still to come? Um, why don't we start with you, Kenny. Do, do we have most of what we need, or is there still a need for pretty significant technological breakthroughs in addition to market breakthroughs? You know, I think we have, I think we've got a good pace. I, I don't feel an urge to go out and, and overbuild or, or under, design or under engineer, I think you have to be careful. Uh, we need engineered solutions that have sustainable long-term value and benefits to consumers. And I, I don't, uh, I'd be very cautionary about a, a need to, to push the envelope and force solutions into an, a, a system. This, our economies are so dependent on uh, reliable, resilient and safe and secure electricity. We really don't want to take uh, new risks that aren't necessary. And, uh, I, you know, you look at look at our, uh, our our market in Texas today. We have nearly 18 gigawatts of clean energy that's that's continues to be built at a large scale utility scale uh, that's shipped from West Texas over to the load centers. And 
on some days, there's 40% of the energy that's supplying the market is, uh, or at least the capacity is it, uh, is is either wind or solar. So we're 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 making major strides all across the United States in, in cleaning the the supply of energy and providing more. Uh, uh, c- consumer features and functionalities and, and values. I, I think our, our pace is good today, Ron. I, I would really be careful not to want to accelerate beyond what the, the, the utilities are doing today. So you think a lot of the technologies are there, and, and, and you put a, a very important point here, which is that there's a little bit of adversity to, to too much risk, right? This is a utility we're talking about that needs to deliver the electrons. Um, Um, Ann and Steve, some comments or thoughts around, you know, are the technologies here? Are we going to see a lot more breakthroughs in the next five to ten years? Yeah, this is this is Steve. Steve, I'll go next, Ann. Sorry. sorry. Um, You know, technology is clearly not a barrier right now. But but that said, you know, it's hard to know what you don't know. Right. So there may be technology around the corner that could really provide some innovation that we're not aware of that could really make things different you know it's it's a little bit like asking the question back in you know 1999 do we have all the technology we need for the internet and and the answer was probably yes but we had no idea what innovation was still you know to come that would make an impact and i i think innovation continues to be important but it's clearly not the gating factors um on, on deploying these technologies right now. Well, and, and certainly anything energy storage related is, is requiring some pretty significant breakthroughs. But that's good to know. Ann, what's, what's your take? Do, do we have a lot of the technologies we need here? Or um... Yes, I was going to agree that a lot of the technologies are here. They'll continue to evolve and advance. I was going to mention the uh, uh, future of storage. I'll also add that you know our national labs, third parties, and others are developing new analytics and models to even further improve the grid's operational efficiency. So I think there's there's going to be continuous improvement. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I mean, when when we say technology, we kind of think of widgets and hardware, but a lot of the innovation now is really in the data analytics side. And I, Kenny, you may want to comment more on that. But you know, we're, we're utilities are getting kind of deluged with data now and trying to understand how best to use those, that data to provide better models, better analytics, better operations. Is Penny on analytics, do you want to comment on that? Well, as a, as a the utility of the, of the past, we were kind of a poles and a wire and transformer and, you know, a lot of blue collar work and we still are today. That's still our bread and butter and that's our core competency. But if you look at a utility, you look at a utility today, you're going to see a lot of technology savvy, uh, young, and, and well-educated, and, and very smart, intelligent uh, resources. And they're, they're building applications as we speak inside the utilities that are going to provide much better visibility, much be- better functionality, much better customer and consumer uh, applications. And so as, as leaders of our companies and as leaders of, of, of the regulatory and, and the in- industry uh, policy side, we we should expect the the pace to, to continue to be uh, enabling initiative and, and for these young and, and, and very well-trained employees to, to make, once you build the platforms, then as, as you heard uh, Steve say earlier, like, like the internet, we're building sort of our utility version of the internet today. And once those platforms are built and people understand how to use them, you're going to, you're going to see further benefits that are going to be very exciting for the industry. Well, I think we're going to end on that uplifting note. Uh, obviously, as we pointed out, this is a very nascent uh, industry. Um, lots of changes will continue to unfold. Uh, please join me in thanking Ann McCabe, Kenneth Mercado, and Steve Hauser joining me today. And, and I'm sure the conversation will continue. So thank you, everyone. And look for a posting of this webinar on the Clean Edge website uh, later tomorrow. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Thank you.